I'd like to thank our funders. These are the funders who provide support to the Canadian Cochrane Center, which allow us to conduct these webinars. In particular, I'd like to thank the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the inst institutes that are listed there. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this work and provide training. I'd like to thank PAHO especially, not only for providing the software that we're using, but a special thank you to Luis Gabriel Cuervo, who creates videos for us, which allow us to go back to these webinars at a later time and to post them online. So thank you very much to PAHO for their support. Today's webinar is on supporting evidence-informed policymaking, the role of health systems evidence, stakeholder dialogues, and other initiatives. Today's presenter is Dr. John Lavis. John's the director of the McMaster Health Forum and a professor at McMaster University. He's also adjunct professor of global health, Department of Global Health and Population, Harvard School of Public Health. He led the creation and oversees the continuous updating of health systems evidence, and he oversees the policy liaison office of the Canadian Cochrane Center. He runs one day and two day workshops on using research evidence for governments and international agencies. And I'd like to turn the microphone over to John to give today's talk. Thanks, John. Thanks, Erin. Can you just confirm that you can hear me OK? Erin, can you just confirm you can hear me all right? You're just a little quiet there, John. So if you could speak just a little louder, that'd be great. Thanks. OK, thanks very much. So thanks very much to the Canadian Cochrane Center for inviting me to give the webinar today and to Erin in particular for helping me get set up. And I'd like to reiterate her thank you to the Pan American Health Organization and especially Luis Gabriel, uh, who I believe is uh, in on the session, both for all of the technological support, but also because it was him that had the idea of having a short series uh, focused on the topic of supporting evidence-informed policymaking. So you'll hear from me this week. Uh, next week, you'll hear from Julia Belouz, who is a journalist who works for both McLean's Magazine and the Medical Post. She'll be talking about evidence-based reporting. Um, and then uh, I think it's the following week, you'll be hearing from a colleague of mine, uh, François Pierre Gauvin, who will be giving the same webinar as I'm giving today, but in French. So uh, thanks very much to Luis Gabriel. So we'll move on to the presentation. So I'm going to be talking about supporting evidence-informed policymaking. And I'm going to focus on two initiatives in particular, health systems evidence and stakeholder dialogues. But I'm also going to make reference to some other initiatives. And as Erin mentioned, I'm happy, if anything's unclear, to take questions of clarification as I go along. So don't hesitate to put up your hand. If I fail to see it, Erin um, will uh, notify me so that uh, we can take your question. So the plan for the talk is to talk briefly about some of the challenges of using research evidence to support health policymaking, and then to try and situate these two initiatives that we're particularly excited about, health systems evidence, which is also home to the evidence-informed healthcare renewal portal, which I'll also mention, and then also stakeholder dialogues, both the ones that we run here at the McMaster Health Forum, but also the ones that are run in a number of countries around the world uh, under the auspices of a VIPNET, Evidence-Informed Policy Networks. If I go on to the next slide, this is a slide that quickly goes through the challenges in using research evidence to inform policymaking. So the first one is that research evidence competes with many other factors in the policymaking process. So policymakers are working under a number of institutional constraints about what they can and can't do for constitutional and other reasons. They're dealing with a variety of different forms of interest group pressure. They're dealing with many sources of ideas. Those can include people's personal beliefs. They can include our collective values. And they can include research evidence, along with many other types of information. And then they're also dealing with what we sometimes call external factors or external events, so things like changes in the global economy that can have a big impact on which options might be considered at one point in time and not considered viable at another point in time. Second challenge is that research evidence isn't valued as an information input. So people simply don't see that it carries a lot of weight in the policymaking process. Third, research isn't relevant. So even if it's valued, when people have very specific questions about for example, how to strengthen the healthcare system in their province or territory, they can't find relevant evidence. 
And the last challenge is that research evidence isn't easy to use. So we have the good fortune to find evidence, but we find it very difficult to make sense of it. So those are some of the challenges. On the next slide, you'll see that I've said that a healthy ecosystem, and by a healthy ecosystem here, I mean essentially an environment or a policymaking context that is open and receptive to using research evidence in decision making, it requires most of these challenges to be addressed. You'll see I've dropped off one of the challenges that research competes with many other factors in the policymaking process because that one is usually considered just a reality of life in modern democracies, that we live in democracies where a variety of these other factors have to be taken into consideration, and we recognize that research evidence is only one of the inputs into that decision. But the other challenges are things that we can do something about. We can improve the climate for research use so that policymakers, stakeholders, all of them agree that research evidence is a critical input to the policymaking process. We can improve the production of research evidence in the sense of ensuring that the research that's produced, or at least a significant proportion of it, is directly relevant to the types of decisions that policymakers and stakeholders are facing. We can also try and translate that evidence in ways that make it more usable and useful to policymakers and stakeholders. And you'll see some of the jargon for the, from the field here. So we can try and communicate research more effectively. So we, another way of saying that is we can push it more effectively to the people who can act on it. We can make it available when policymakers need it and in a form that they can use. So we sometimes call that facilitating pull, making it easier for people to reach into the world of research and pull out what they need. We can introduce mechanisms to prompt policymaking, uh, policymakers to use research in decision making. Any of you who've spent time in a Ministry of Health will know it's often a very frantic environment, huge deadlines, lots of things going on, juggling many competing priorities. It's hard to stand back and ask the question, have we really thought this through and do we know where the evidence stands on these issues we're dealing with? And the final challenge is that policymakers lack forums where ch policy challenges can be worked through with key stakeholders informed by the best available research evidence, and that we sometimes call exchange. So ideally, we have all of these going on, a healthy climate, a great flow of relevant research evidence, great efforts to communicate that effectively, easy for policymakers and stakeholders to find what they need, prompts to ensure that they take the time to do this, and opportunities to come together with all of the key players to talk through what does the evidence mean in our context right now. If I go on to the next slide, some of these challenges can be addressed from within government. So on this slide, I've underlined four examples of what I, as an outsider, see happening within the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care that seems to have made a very tangible difference in how research evidence is being used in policymaking. It's not necessarily the case, just like any other jurisdiction in the world, that all decisions are well informed by research evidence, but I think we've seen a lot of progress in that one particular jurisdiction, in part because of very clear signals from the top. Assistant Deputy Ministers clearly articulating that as a, a civil service whose role is in part to advise elected officials and help them make informed decisions, a key part of that is harnessing research evidence effectively. Second thing would be a new performance criterion for civil servants to cause them to once a year ask the question, how, can I, how have I used research evidence in at least one way as part of a policy development process in the last year? Third example, would be if I jump down to 3C, the research evidence tool, now required to as something that people need to fill out if they want to take something up to ministry management committee or to cabinet. To clearly describe how evidence was sought in trying to understand the policy problem, policy options, or implementation considerations. And the final thing, because all three of those created a demand for this, training of both the senior folks so they know what expectations to set for their staff and the folks who actually do the work, so they're well equipped to do. 
So I knew that I had a question. I just wanted to finish that slide. So Najma, would you like to ask a question? If you do, just click on top. And once you've asked your question, just click on top again to release the mic so I can take back the mic. So I'll turn off my mic. Just click talk about the participants. Thanks for that opportunity, John. Um, the message from Najma is that uh, that they're having trouble listening. Um, so I'll follow up uh, after the after the session with some slides for that. Thank you. Okay, great. So let me move on to the next slide then, which is about things that can be done from outside government. So I mentioned before I'm going to talk about two examples. So if you look at three B. I'm going to talk about health systems evidence as an example of facilitating pull, making it easier for people to reach into the world of research evidence, whether they have five minutes or five hours or five days or five weeks to find the available evidence, and also stakeholder dialogues as an example of a forum where policy challenges can be worked through with key stakeholders. I've also written in Sciencefish, which is the column that Julia Belouz writes on a regular basis in the online version of McLean's, where she identifies statements made by prominent Canadian health leaders about big issues of the day in health, and then looks to see whether there's good research evidence backing up their statements. It's an excellent way of raising the bar in terms of how research evidence feeds into public discussions about healthcare, and through that, ultimately, hopefully, has an impact on whether politicians and others use evidence as part of their decision making. So you'll hear more about that next week from Julia. So I'll launch in then to health systems evidence as the first of the two initiatives I'm going to talk about. So you'll see here a screen capture of the home page for health systems evidence. You'll see a description, the world's most comprehensive free access point for evidence to support policymakers, stakeholders, and researchers interested in, and it could be one of two things, how to strengthen or reform health systems, a big preoccupation in a country like Canada, or you could think about it as how to get cost-effective programs, services, and drugs to those who need them. You'll also see off to the right here that health systems evidence is also home to Canada's evidence-informed healthcare renewal portal, which are all of the policy-relevant documents from Canadian federal, provincial, and territorial jurisdictions that have to do with healthcare renewal. A key part of the context in which we're undertaking evidence-informed policymaking and often a key source of evidence that can feed into that process. So that is knit together along with the best evidence into health systems evidence. So the first poll is about how often you have personally used health systems evidence. So in a minute, uh, Aaron will make available to you a poll. And I would just ask you to pick A if the answer is never. And please be honest, my feelings won't be hurt. B, once. C two or three times, and D, four or more times. So could you please click one of A, B, C, or D? And just a quick reminder to people to please use the polling option that's at the top of the participants window. Unfortunately, if you type into the chat, your responses won't be, uh, won't be noted. So please use the polling option that's at the top of the participants window with the letter A. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that reminder, Aaron. Uh, so, and Aaron, if you don't mind reminding me, if I forget, in case it scrolls by, I see a question from Anneliese, which I'll return to when I get back to the stakeholder dialogues part of the presentation. So if I forget, uh, hopefully you or Anneliese can remind me. So the poll results, uh, let's see, 42% of you uh, said you've never used it. 2% of you said you've used it once. 10% of you said you've used it two or three times, and 12% of you said four or more times. And I guess one third of you uh, didn't respond. So a lot of you have never used health systems evidence, which is important for me to know as I move ahead. So thanks very much. So we'll clear the poll, and I'll move on then to a bit of background. So health systems evidence provides the full range of research evidence relevant to clarifying the problem. So for example, if you wanted to see a systematic review of all the studies in the world 
that help you understand how stakeholders view or experience a particular problem in the health system, like waitlist, or it could simply be studies conducted in Canada, that would be in Health System 7. On the other hand, if you were trying to work out what do we know about the benefits, harms, and cost effectiveness of an option for reducing wait times, there could well be a systematic review about benefits, a systematic review that looked at harms, an economic evaluation that looks at cost effectiveness. You would also find in Health Systems evidence systematic reviews that deal with the how and why questions. So these could be process evaluations carried out alongside studies of effects to understand how and why an intervention works. And if you're interested in implementation considerations, you could find a systematic review of barriers to the implementation of waitlist management initiatives. So it's a very broad array of types of research evidence that help you understand a problem, help you understand what we know about options, and help you think through issues related to implementation. So health systems evidence is an effort to address the issue of timeliness, which has been found to be one of the factors associated with the use of research evidence. So if I get an urgent call from the minister, I have five minutes to prepare for a briefing, I can do a quick search of health systems evidence and see if there is a one or two documents immediately relevant to my question. If I move on to the next slide, how did we go about developing it? Well, we developed a taxonomy of health system arrangements and implementation strategies so that we could comprehensively map everything that was out there and people could feel reassured that if we had coded a particular set of documents as, for example, remuneration arrangements, so do they give us insights into alternative mechanisms of remunerating positions and what we know about the costs and consequences of those methods, that they could tick that particular box and know we had covered everything. So we had to come up with a comprehensive taxonomy. We also needed to come up with a taxonomy of relevant document types. You'll see the types that we include in a moment. We had to identify the key features of documents, and we had to identify derivative products that policymakers and stakeholders told us they wanted to have at hand when they were searching for or scanning documents. So we make available things like uh, the year that the document was published or the last time the literature was searched, if it's a systematic review. We make available a rating of the quality of the systematic review. We tell you what countries the studies were conducted in, so you have an immediate sense of whether there will be a local applicability challenge when you're interpreting that evidence. We also provide links to user-friendly summaries written by any of the eight groups in the world that produce those types of summaries. So again, a busy individual who finds a document could click on one of the user-friendly summaries and literally cut and paste what is often a plain language summary into a briefing note or other type of document. We also identified languages that would allow us to reach most policymakers and stakeholders in at least one language in which they're comfortable reading. And we ended up picking seven languages that give us a remarkable uh, breadth across the world in terms of languages that people are comfortable reading. In Canada, of course, the principal interest is English and French, and health systems evidence is fully functional in those languages, as well as five others. Two independent assessors then review on a weekly or monthly basis websites, listservs, or direct feeds from large-scale producers of syntheses. So if your question is about health systems or about implementation considerations, you no longer would need to search the Cochrane Library separately. If you search health systems evidence, you will find any Cochrane review that speaks to the issue of health systems. We also get information from identifiers and raters of syntheses and other types of documents. So you do not need to search the Center for Reviews and Dissemination in York. You would not need to search McMaster Plus or many others or similar uh, websites. And we also track uh, listservs and other sources from disseminators of syntheses and other types of documents. Equidad run by PAHO, eWatch uh, run here in Canada. So all of these are being searched weekly or monthly, depending on how frequently they come out, and the documents are immediately added to health system updates. 
Two independent coders conduct eligibility assessments, data extraction, data coding, and linking to ensure that there's a very, very low error rate. And we work in partners in a number of countries. PAHO is one of them to translate the document titles and all supporting materials into French and five other languages. So it's a remarkably efficient back of house function to make sure that policymakers, stakeholders, and researchers around the world have immediate access to the best available evidence about health systems. So did you have a comment or question, Erin? Yep, there was a quick question from uh, Janet Gunderson, John, asking whether lay people had access to the website or whether you needed to be a doctor. Nope, anyone in the world can access it at any time. There's a very simple registration process. It's free. It, the registration process probably takes about one minute. Um, and so anyone in the world can access it. So we, we know we have policymakers, stakeholders, researchers, members of the public from around the world who are registered for it. So by all means, it's open to the public and absolutely free of charge. So let me move on to the next question. How many systematic reviews, so this is going to be a poll again that Aaron is going to set up so you can vote. How many systematic reviews do you think exist in the world right now that address questions about health system arrangements and implementation strategies. So questions like, what do we know about involving consumers in the governance of hospitals? Questions like, what do we know about different ways of funding hospitals? Questions like, uh, are nurse practitioners a safe and effective alternative to family physicians in providing the vast array of primary health care? So those are questions about health system arrangements. How many do you think are out there? So please vote A if you think there are none, that we don't yet have any systematic reviews on these types of big topics. B if you think it's between 1 and 200. C between 200 and 2,000. And D if you think it's more than uh, 2,000. So please vote A, B, C, or D. So we're getting a remarkably even split. So no one's saying none. So that's reassuring. We all agree that there's now a lot of relevant synthesized evidence out there. So we have 25% of people voting for B, between 1 and 200, 26% voting for C, between 200 and 2,000, and 27% voting for more than 2,000. So those of you who said a more than 2,000 B, that's correct. We just broke the 2,000 barrier. Uh, for systematic reviews, uh, so we'll see that in the very next slide. So thank you very much for voting. So now if we turn to another screen capture from Health Systems Evidence, this I thought was the most efficient way of explaining what's in this database. You'll see all documents is highlighted because I didn't restrict the search to a type of document when I ran the search. 42 are evidence briefs for policy. These are documents that start with a policy problem and mobilize all the evidence about the problem. Two or three, typically three options for addressing it and key implementation considerations. So these are the inputs to the stakeholder dialogues I'll talk about in a minute. You'll see 33 overviews of systematic reviews. So in a way, these are maps of where we have uh, systematic reviews or synthesized evidence. So Imagine a, a, a table that has as the columns different outcomes like efficiency and improved health and the rows, all of the policy levers that we could use to influence how health workers function in the system. An overview would give you a map of where there are systematic reviews at the intersection between those policy levers and those outcomes. So what do we know, for example, of training as a policy lever to improve health outcomes among the general population. Systematic reviews of effects, we're now at 2015. There are now increasing numbers of systematic reviews addressing other questions. These could be systematic reviews of qualitative studies or mixed method studies looking at things like stakeholders' views about a problem or about how and why interventions work or about barriers to implementation. We have over 1,200 economic evaluations looking at things like the cost effectiveness of different providers in delivering, say, primary health care. We have over 250 systematic reviews in progress. That means there's a registered protocol with the, with 
the Cochrane Collaboration. So people are actively working on the review. So if there's no existing review and you're working on a high priority issue, you could contact the authors directly and ask if they could share interim results. Systematic reviews being planned are at an, an even earlier stage in development. Someone has registered the title and they're currently working on the protocol. Health reform descriptions are rich descriptions of why particular governments chose to reform aspects of their system in different ways and what is being learned about that process. So these are drawn from about 20, 25 predominantly high income countries, including Canada. And starting hopefully in the coming year, we'll start to see a lot more coming out of Canada focused at the level of provinces and territories. Over 200 descriptions of health systems. So if you learn about an innovation happening in the United Kingdom, but you want to know how that's embedded within broader aspects of how the National Health Service works, you could go to the health system description for England or Scotland or Wales and find out that piece of the system, how that works. And then we have 580 documents about Canadian healthcare renewal documents. So that's the evidence-informed healthcare renewal portal all of the rich policy relevant documents in Canada that are identified by a broad array of stakeholders that have been convened by CIHR's Institute for Health Services and Policy Research and that we identify through a separate search of the web and this is updated monthly. So a quick question. Hi John, you there were a couple of uh, substantial questions from Marie and Robert that we'll save to the end, but Barbara had a quick question about whether the, uh, whether the database includes reviews of long-term health care as well. Absolutely. I, in the interface that I'm on now, I couldn't tell you the exact number, but we do have a set of what we call limits or ways of restricting a search to particular areas of interest. And long-term care is one of the domains. So if you want to zero in on that, when you go into health systems evidence, if you go to advanced search, you'll be able to click on long-term care as one of the sectors, and then you would get all of the documents relevant to long-term care. You could do the same for primary care or acute care or other settings. So there's many, many ways of cutting the searches so that you zero in on areas of particular interest. Thanks, John. So let, thanks. So let me move on to give you a quick sense about the distribution of documents by health system topic. I'll just start in the lower left corner you'll see that almost 5,000 of them deal with delivery arrangements. Very practical questions about how care is designed to meet consumers' needs, about who are the optimal providers of health care, about where care is provided, should we be regionalizing care into large uh, tertiary facilities, or is it best delivered in a much more decentralized way. The next biggest group would be implementation strategies. So these are ways of engaging consumers, for example, in making more informed decisions about their own care, uh, trying to influence the practice of providers to ensure it aligns more closely with the best available evidence, or trying to bring about change at the level of organizations. The third biggest category would be governance arrangements, so issues related to who has authority to make certain types of decisions. So for example, our nurse practitioners, um, given the authority to provide certain types of care. And then the final category would be financial arrangements. So this might look at issues related to, again, how can we remunerate providers? What do we know from the evidence about that particular domain? So a broad array of issues and health systems evidence can be searched either at this level by saying, I'd like to see everything you have on remunerating providers, or given that's so big, perhaps you'd like to cut it so that you only get that information for the long-term care setting. I now move on to give you a sense of where the user-friendly summaries come from. So two-thirds of the reviews in health systems evidence have a summary from the database of abstracts of reviews of effects. 17% are the Cochrane plain language summaries. 9% come from an initiative also supported by Cochrane, Rx for Change. And then you'll see the others account for uh, smaller percentages. So a number of documents will have multiple user-friendly summaries. Most will have at least one. So another poll 
So this time the question is, how many policymakers do you think have registered to use health systems evidence? So I said already registration is free. It's just a quick way of allowing us to know, are we reaching the right people? So we just ask a few questions, one of which is, are you currently a policymaker? So do you think that as of right now, we've probably had registration operating for about nine or 12 months. Do you think we currently have no policymakers registered between one and 1,000, between 1,000 and 10,000, or more than 10,000? So please vote A, B, C, or D. The polling options are available at the top of the participants' chat room. You'll see the letter A with a drop-down. If you could please use the drop-down to indicate your choice, that'd be great. Excellent. So it seems that most people uh, have voted for option B. So about one half of you, 50% have voted for option B, between 1 and 1,000. And the next biggest group is down at 20%. Option C between 1,000 and 10,000. So option C was right, but I have to admit it was just by a hair. So if you look at the next page, I'll zero down here. We currently have 1,138 registered policymakers using health systems evidence. Another 587 are managers. So those might be people in regional health authorities and hospitals and primary care clinics. You'll see on this page some other statistics. About half of the individuals have signed up to receive the customizable evidence service each month. So if you're interested in a particular topic, um, then you can sign up to receive every month any new documents uh, added to health systems evidence in that domain. About 16% prefer a language other than English. About half are based outside of Canada. About 13% have enabled the EIHR portal content. So this isn't relevant to Canadians. If you're in Canada, you have full functional use of the evidence-informed healthcare renewal portal. If you're outside Canada, however, you have to enable the content. We wanted this to be first and foremost for Canadians. However, people outside Canada can enable that content. And about 13% of our international users have enabled that content. So that's a quick run through of health systems evidence. I wanted to point out, though, that no database is a solution to all of our questions. So health systems evidence is excellent if you have a, a broad array of questions related to health system arrangements and implementation strategies. But if your question is about the effects of clinical programs, services, and about drugs, the Cochrane Library would be the place to go to get a broad array of synthesized evidence. If your question is about systematic reviews of the effects of public health programs and services, so switching from clinical to public health, healthevidence.ca would be the place to go. And if you wanted other types of documents, we have an additional resources document available through the EIHR portal that provides a number of other key databases that complement the ones that I've listed here. Uh, we also, an example of that would be the Health Council of Canada runs a health innovation portal. If you'd like to know about innovations and in practices and programs and policies, then that portal would be a good place to go. Another one which isn't a database is the Evidence Network, which some of you will know as a group that writes periodic opinion pieces that draw on evidence about salient health system questions or health policy questions. So those are, again, part of the important healthy ecosystem that we have in Canada supporting evidence and informed policy. So quick question, Erin. Thanks, John. Just a quick question of clarification that we had from Mandy. She wondered if you could just clarify for us whether there are similarities between healthevidence.ca and health systems evidence. So are, are they both at the level of synopses of syntheses. Thanks. So healthevidence.ca only includes systematic reviews of effects. So it's one of the many types of documents that health systems evidence tackles. And it focuses specifically on public health programs and services, whereas health systems evidence is focused on a different domain, which is about health system arrangements. So healthevidence.ca might answer the question, uh, what do we know about the effectiveness of an immunization campaign? 
Uh, health systems evidence, on the other hand, might ask questions about how do we organize ourselves to deliver uh, immunization campaigns. So one is more on programs and services. The other is the health system arrangements or the implementation strategies used to achieve, in that case, high rates of coverage. And then the other thing is healthevidence.ca writes user-friendly summaries of each of the reviews in their database. We link to, in health systems evidence, any of the eight groups in the world that write user-friendly summaries, one of which is healthevidence.ca. So they have similarities but they have very important differences. You want healthevidence.ca if your question is the effectiveness of public health programs and services. You want health systems evidence if it's questions around how we organize ourselves, govern ourselves, set up financial arrangements, put in place implementation strategies, and if your questions are much broader than simply questions about effects. So hopefully that was clear. I'm going to move on now to stakeholder dialogues. So I'm going to be talking about these dialogues based on experiences with now having run 21 of them here at the McMaster Health Forum. We have currently four in the planning stage, so we'll soon be at 25. And the experience with my colleagues like Luis Gabriel Cuervo and others of supporting this type of activity in a range of AVIFNETs around the world, many of which are in Latin America and the Caribbean, but they're also in Africa the Western Pacific, uh, soon in the Eastern Mediterranean region, and in the European region. So my question for you here, and I know that this is a bit of an unfair question because you might not have a sense about what I mean by stakeholder dialogues, and I'm going to come to that in a minute, but based on what you think stakeholder dialogues are, can I ask you how often have you participated in a stakeholder dialogue? So A, never, B, once, C, two or three times, and D, four or more times. Great, so we seem to have a remarkable spread, actually. So we have almost equal numbers of people who said never, 27%, and who said four or more times, 32%. Uh, and then coming after that, uh, oh, no, sorry, sorry, that 27% said never and 21% said four or more times. So very, very interesting. Let's move on to some background. So why do we care about stakeholder dialogues? Well, they allow research evidence to be brought together with the views, experiences, and tacit knowledge of those who will be involved in or affected by future decisions about a high priority issue. We all know that evidence is very helpful in the policymaking process but it also needs to be considered alongside people's views, experiences, and tacit knowledge. And stakeholder dialogues allow us to do that. Second thing is they enable the types of interactions between policymakers and researchers that have been found to be one of the factors associated with the use of research evidence in policymaking. So that chance to talk through what does the evidence mean in our context for this particular issue at this moment in time. And dialogues can help get there. Some reasons for the increasing interest in dialogues, the perception that we need much more locally contextualized decision support for policymakers and stakeholders. So what do we need in the Winnipeg region specifically as opposed to in a variety of other parts of the country? Research evidence is only one input into the policymaking processes of policymakers and stakeholders is another reason, because stakeholder dialogues allow you to bring all of those other factors to bear, institutional constraints, considerations about interest group pressure, conversations about values, reflections on widely held beliefs, external factors like the economy. Third, many stakeholders can add significant value to policymaking processes, and this is a way of formalizing that. And finally, many stakeholders can take action to address high priority issues, not just policymakers. So when we first began this work with the World Health Organization, we tended to call them policy dialogues. But in Canada, we've always called them stakeholder dialogues to avoid everyone looking down the table at the assistant deputy minister or the deputy saying, so now what are you going to do? Because as we often say at these dialogues, everyone in the room is probably a little bit of the problem, and they can almost certainly be a big part of the solution, not just the people who are there from government. So we're using the term dialogue here in part in contrast to the notion of debate. So you'll see here 
a, a head-to-head comparison of the two. So the dialogue approach, more collaborative, more effort to search for agreement, to look for strength, to listen to what other people are saying and to try and understand it. So it's a very, very different ethos than the kind of conflictual debate that we very often see in a number of public forums. So we have a number of questions that we always ask, both about our own dialogues to understand how we can improve them, and to understand when other people talk about stakeholder dialogues, whether they're talking about the same thing. So we hear a lot of people in government saying, oh, we do a lot of stakeholder engagement. But when we run through these questions, it's immediately very clear that they're talking about something very different from what we mean by these deliberative dialogues. So I'll run through each of these questions briefly in turn. So does the dialogue address a high, prior or high priority issue? So we usually try to address an issue that's on the governmental agenda. It doesn't have to have moved to the decision agenda, but we know government's at least keeping a watch over the issue and be widely perceived by many, if not all, stakeholders as a priority. This doesn't mean you can't tackle issues that have just emerged on the horizon, but we do try and pick issues that have a little bit of momentum. Second, the selection of the issue and the key decisions about how to address it can be informed by a steering committee comprised of select policymakers and stakeholders. So we don't make all these judgments on our own. We have a group of key people who help us for each dialogue work out some of the really uh, tough decisions that we have to go through to pull off a successful dialogue. Second, the agenda. Does the dialogue provide opportunities to discuss the problem? options for addressing the problem, and key implementation considerations. So you'll, you'll recognize that language from my earlier comments about evidence briefs, which also deal with those questions. The agenda typically has separate deliberations about the problem. Are we on the same page about what the real issue is here, about each of the options in turn, about implementation considerations, and the key one where the magic hopefully happens is next steps for different constituencies. So who needs to do what to walk away from here to bring about concrete action? I put at the bottom that some people could modify this so they give more focus, for example, to the evidence contained in the brief as opposed to all of the other factors that influence decision making. We give equal attention to all of those considerations in the policy process. Third, is the dialogue informed by a pre-circulated evidence brief and by a discussion about the full range of factors? So we work through a set of terms of reference that are refined based on input from the steering committee and usually about 20 key informants. We write the briefs and circulate it 10 days before the dialogue to the dialogue invitees, and it's taken as read. There's no presentation from an expert at the front of the room. It's a jumping off point, and everyone around the table is an equal participant no one's expertise is any more important than anyone else's. And the discussion has to address the full range of factors that influence the policymaking process. So institutional constraints, interest group pressure, and so on. The same issues I mentioned before. Question four, fair representation. Very tough thing to do. We try and do stakeholder mapping to generate a list of people who would be involved in or affected by a future decision and we pick the people who are invited to attend based on two criteria, which you'll see on this slide. One is they bring a lot to the table, ideally the perspectives of key constituencies, but also very critically they'll walk away from that table and champion the types of actions that will address the issue within their respective constituencies. So my question to you, I think this is our last poll, how many participants do you think it would take to balance fair representation, which we probably all agree we want, but also meaningful participation. So people over the course of a day have a meaningful opportunity to contribute to a discussion about the problem, options, implementation considerations, and next steps. Is it A, less than 15, B, between 15 and 19, C, between 20 and 25, or D, more than 25? So can you vote for A, B, C, or D. Wow, almost a perfectly even split. So 19% less than 15, 20% 15 to 19, 
uh, 18%, 20 to 25, fascinating. So I can tell you that our experience is it hovers between B and C. So if we go to the low end of B, 15, 16, our sense is we're, we're, we often feel like we're missing someone. There's something that's like there's just not enough energy there or enough divergent perspectives. If we go high into the high, in closer to 25, we find that a lot of people feel like they just can't engage frequently enough. So there's something magical, at least in the 21 we've done, in the kind of 20, 22, 23 range. But that's our personal experience. If I move on, uh, there's a dialogue engage a facilitator, ideally one who's skilled, knowledgeable, and neutral. Does it have a rule about whether or not comments can be attributed? So we use a Chatham House rule. You can use anything you learned at the dialogue. You're just asked not to attribute it back to an individual with the hope then that everyone will feel that they can speak freely without concern that they'll be then hauled on the carpet by a boss or by a colleague with a comment attributed back to them. And the goal for the dialogue has to be made clear. So we say explicitly we are not aiming for consensus. We do not think it's feasible to ask a deputy to commit his or her government without going back and speaking to the minister and engage in cabinet. Similarly, for the CEOs of large organizations, for people representing charities or consumer groups, it's very hard to make that commitment. But if it emerges spontaneously, fantastic but our focus is trying to find where is their shared ground that's consistent with where the organization is already um, interested in or has expressed an interest in going. Next steps, are outputs produced and follow-up activities undertaken? Otherwise, this doesn't help anyone other than the privileged few in the room. So we typically produce a dialogue summary and disseminate that widely to capture the tacit knowledge, the real world views and experiences, we typically do personalized briefings after to some of the key players. We do we post video interviews with dialogue participants about what they took out of it. For one year, we run an evidence service. Every month, we bring to attention any new evidence on the topic. But there's also things on this list that some of our VIPNet colleagues do that we don't do. They invite media to the closing of the dialogue for conversations with the key participants. Uh, and we probably could do a better job of writing journal publications that describe what we learned. An example of a complementary initiative are citizen panels. So we have citizen representatives at these stakeholder dialogues, but they're often very savvy representatives of broader consumer groups. They're not often a person off the street. However, there are a number of initiatives in Canada. The Change Foundation uh, has launched one. Uh, we're going to be launching some here with the support of Julie Abelson, where we have citizen panels. Everyone in the room is a citizen, as opposed to having a small number of citizens mixed in with a broader group of policymakers and other types of stakeholders. So that also uses a deliberative approach, uh, but slightly different for that different audience. So to wrap up, um, I, I was at a conference recently organized by the Research Transfer Network of Alberta, and they asked me to address the question, is evidence-informed policymaking an achievable goal or an oxymoron? And I said, I think it's an achievable goal, provided that we recognize that research evidence is just one input into policymaking, and it can be used in many different ways and in each stage of the policymaking process, and we work very hard to develop and test innovative strategies to support the use of evidence. I've given you an example of two in particular, health systems evidence and stakeholder dialogues, as part of a multifaceted initiative that's adapted to the local context. So our life is made easier by, for our work in Ontario, for concrete things the Ontario government did to provide a more receptive climate. It's also made easier by the existence of sciences, by many other initiatives taken together, I think it can make a big difference. I've provided some resources at the end, so you'll be sent the slides if you're interested in them. These just give you some follow-up resources that you can go to. And on health systems evidence, uh, you'll see that you can access the searchable database and then sign up for the monthly evidence service. You can access a number of downloadable PDFs if you want our crash course, one-page cheat sheet on finding and using evidence. That would be this one. You'll also see some videos. So for example, if you want to watch a five-minute video so you know how to get the most of the evidence in from Healthcare Renewal Portal, you can access that for free, like all of our resources on health systems evidence. So I think 
that that's it except for some acknowledgments. So CIHR for funding, our other funders of stakeholder dialogues, and for the EIHR portal in particular, a wide variety of uh, organizations have come together to support that process, and we'll see their logos here. So I spoke for longer than I thought, but Aaron, um, why don't I turn it over to you to see, have you been collecting a few that you'd like me to start with? A few questions, I should say? Aaron, are you still there? Thanks a lot, John. Um, as we are waiting for some questions to come through, I'm just sent a quick link through to the chat room, which is an evaluation form. So if you could please take a moment to take a look at that, um, we'd really appreciate it. I'm going back up into the chat room to catch some of the questions that we had back on early in the session, John. If you can just give me a moment there. Um, the uh, the first question that we had was that question that we had from uh, from Annalise. Annalise asked. How do stakeholders gain access to policymakers to participate in forums? John. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I guess I don't know if we call ourselves a stakeholder, but I mean, how we access policymakers is we literally just contact them directly. Uh, you know, we typically have very good experience. It does require a lot of background investigative work of looking through online. Uh, directories of the civil service to identify who's in a particular policy role. We also do key informant interviews with people that help us unearth uh, who the real uh, movers and shakers are on a given policy file so we can contact them directly. Um, but, you know, so far we've had very good luck. But, you know, I think uh, that might be partly because we've invested so heavily in, in trying to be seen as a credible broker of conversations, not taking sides. If you were a stakeholder group that clearly was taking a position on an issue, then I can see that it might be more challenging to try and create a forum in which you could bring policymakers to the table, but our experience has always been there's nothing like asking, and we've always often been pleasantly surprised by people's willingness to participate. Thanks very much, John. We had a question from, uh, from Najma who asked what the other five languages were that, were, uh, that are used in healthevidence.ca, what the other five languages are. Yep, so the other five languages are Arabic, Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. So I mentioned English and French, but we also do Arabic, Chinese, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. So seven languages in total, and health systems evidence is fully functional in all of those languages. The only exception to that would be for the evidence-informed healthcare renewal portal, which is the Canadian-specific document that functions in English and French. But all of the global literature that's sitting in health systems evidence is in all seven languages. Thank you. There was a suggestion to add Urdu and Punjabi if you're considering adding more languages. Great. You um, know, it's funny because we did we did a lot of work uh, trying to figure out how to best reach our colleagues in uh, South Asia, and uh, so that's helpful advice. We we do need to go back to that issue of how we reach that group. So I appreciate those two suggestions. Thank you. We had a question from Marie who asked, "Are materials and documents?" housed on the site in the public domain? Are there issues of copyright? She, she noted that you had mentioned cutting and pasting content into a briefing paper. Yes, yeah, good point. So I probably should, you know, I think the writers of the user-friendly summaries, uh, you know, I shouldn't speak for them all. I think the vast majority would be absolutely thrilled if you were cutting and pasting content into a document to directly inform the decision-making process. Of course, if it's an academic context, then you would have to do all the usual things in terms of putting it in quotes and attributing it properly. Um, so uh, that would be my answer for the user-friendly summaries. What we make available for every document is either one or two scientific abstracts. Those are in the public domain, so you can access those very easily. Any of the eight groups in the world who've written user-friendly summaries, we make the summaries available. Those are in the public domain. And then for full text, roughly one half of the documents in health systems evidence are freely available online, and you can access them directly. The other 50% often typically requires a subscription. And so that's why we put so much effort into finding the other types of documents, the scientific abstracts and user-friendly summaries. But there will be times where you run into a wall. So it could be that it's a Cochrane review 
And so Canada goes through periods where we do and don't have a full uh, subscription to the Cochrane Library. In periods where we do, very easy. You just immediately pull up that document in the Cochrane Library. Periods where we don't, unfortunately, every individual would need to pay for it separately. So we've gone to great lengths to not in any way uh, trample on anyone's copyrights. But at the, and at the same time, we've tried to drive traffic to their site. So we're driving traffic to the writers of user-friendly summaries, to uh, the groups that make their reports available for free. So we're trying to drive traffic to them, but having one quick way for people to find everything that they need. Thanks, John. That, that actually leads into, uh, into Robert's question. Robert noted uh, that you mentioned how the evidence is updated by internal mechanisms. He wondered, is there a means for evidence producers to get the materials included if they are not otherwise added? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pretty sure on most pages, but if not, so we can rectify this. There should be an email address, which is hse, for health systems evidence, at mcmaster.ca. And we're always delighted to have people bring to attention documents. Because we have such a comprehensive process in place, it's very rare that someone points out something we're missing. But when they do, it's often because it's a gray literature publication that hasn't been captured through these many other sources that we rely on. But we're thrilled to have people send us documents directly. And then like all of our documents, two independent coders would review them for eligibility. And if they're eligible, then they would be coded and added to the database very quickly. Great. Thank you. Um, Amy asked whether there were any documents in the database that cover pre-hospital health care. Uh, you know, I'd have to look. But I guess m the, my answer would be I'd be shocked if there wasn't. So there, you know, our experience is that there is a lot of stuff out there on all aspects of care, whether it's pre-hospital or hospital or post-hospital or rehabilitation or primary care or long-term care. We haven't specifically coded the pre-hospital period as a domain that you can use as a limit. So it's not as easy as it would be with primary care or if you pick a disease like cancer or heart disease to zero in on a sub fraction. But you can use the open search to zero in on it fairly uh, efficiently. So I'd be shocked if there wasn't stuff there. But I can't speak from first-hand experience because we've never done a search with that particular focus. OK, thank you, John. We had a comment from Annalise who said, I worked with a bunch of researchers years ago, and we held stakeholder consultations and wanted to also involve policymakers, but could not get them to come. What is your advice for accessing policymakers or gaining their participation? Well, I guess our communication to them you know, is quite an elaborate explanation about our process, uh, what we're trying to achieve, and so on. Um, so I think that makes a big difference, that people are very clear about what the rules of the game are. They're very clear about what the agenda is going to be. They're very clear that this is going to be informed by a pre-circulated evidence brief. Um, uh, we're also very clear that we have a steering committee, and we would name the organizations that are members of the steering committee. So they would know that um, you know we might have a representative from the BC Ministry of Health on it, that we might have someone from um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario or a consumer association. So we've spent a lot of time trying to get the letter right in terms of an honest portrayal of our process and what we're trying to achieve so that people can then make an informed decision about, is this something that's really going to add value to the sector? And that seems to have worked for us. What, what gets in the way inevitably is, of course, people's agendas, that you know someone has to see the minister on a certain day, and there's just no way of getting around that. Uh, but we've had remarkable success with a very clear letter that outlines our process and all of the factors that we think contribute to the credibility of the process. And that seems to resonate with people. Thank you. And the last question that we have is, what is the best summary portal for finding evidence regarding funding policies for chronic diseases? Funding policies for chronic diseases. So funding in the sense of how would we fund hospitals to provide care to people living with chronic diseases? Is it funding in that sense of funding hospitals? We'll give just a moment for uh, for the the questioner so, to write yeah, in. So yes. Yes. The question yeah, is, so it would be health systems evidence. Yeah. So in health systems evidence under financial arrangements, 
if there is any systematic review in the world that has dealt with um, you know, different funding arrangements for hospitals of the type that you're interested in, it would be in health systems evidence. If there are any economic evaluations that directly compare the costs and effects of different funding models, it would be in health systems evidence. So anything related to governance, financial, and delivery arrangements in health systems or about implementation strategies should be in health systems evidence. And as I said before, we're constantly updating it through weekly and monthly searches. So if it exists, it would be there. If it's not there, you'll find in health systems evidence that you can search for single studies in two other databases using the same search terms. So we provide an option for you if you come up cold on sy synthesized evidence and economic evaluations if you have the time and energy to do the work of finding single studies. Okay. Thank you, John. Before we get into a few more administrative things, um, can I ask everybody to please send through a round of applause to thank John very much for the time that he's taken today. Um, John, this was, a, this was a tremendous webinar and it's been really wonderful having your time today to, uh, to present and speak with us. Thank you.